have a look. Right, so thanks for joining me this evening. I'm presenting today on behalf of my research team um, and the slide deck that I'm presenting with, I will share in the chat as um, towards the end of this session. Everything that looks like a link is a link. This slide deck stays the same at the same link. It's been updated for the last two and a half years. Um, and I just continually update this um, information. If you could come in and make sure that you're on mute, that would be really helpful to everyone else who's listening and in terms of um, uh, the recording. Thanks very much. All right, so I've also turned on transcriptions, so that might help some of you who are dealing with an Australian accent. All right, great. It's really great to have you with me tonight. I'd just like to first of all say I'm zooming in today from Ngunnawal country, Ngunnawal in the Gambri country here in Canberra in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to um, deep respect for the knowledge traditions that have been on this land since time immemorial and to take a moment to acknowledge this land is stolen and sovereignty has never been ceded and the process of reconciliation is ongoing and it takes all of us working together in good faith. Um, all right, so this slide deck will be sent to you as I go through, so I'll just get started. Yeah, can I just interrupt? Sorry, it's Rachel. Your um, screen in screen was showing there for a second, so I'm not sure what was, what was happening there, but your screen, um, so your team's controls were showing over the top. They've disappeared again now, but they were on the previous slide. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, hopefully they've disappeared now. I'll just yep, fly blind. Now. Yep, thank you for that. I'm flying blind. Can't see a word you're saying, so talk amongst yourselves. Okay, thanks for that. Um, obviously, my research team aren't with me tonight, but here is Hana. Hana's uh, a machine learning natural language processing specialist. And um, here is Will, and he works in the Centre for Public Awareness of Science. So I'm presenting on behalf of the team today. And the title of this talk, as ever, is you're finishing your PhD in uncertain times. What's next? Um, we released this slide deck under a Creative Commons share alike non-commercial attribution license. That's a long way of saying you can share it with anyone you like. Um, you can use it in any way you like. You just have to acknowledge us as authors. We put it out there. We keep it updated in order to make sure that you have the latest information to hand. Um, and this is on our machine learning algorithm. Uh, we are a research-led team who explore job advertisements and opportunities for PhD candidates. Some of you are here tonight because you are in universities that subscribe to our product, postact.com.au. Um, if you're in a university that subscribes, you should be able to go to that address and always be able to access the product with your university email. Otherwise, we do release all these reports and as much research as we can, and of course, this lecture every six months. Um, I give this lecture really because this is a snapshot of how PhD students tell me that they're feeling about the job market after their PhD. It's not really a very good picture, is it? This is a word cloud that's been up every time I run this lecture for the last two and a half years. The same words pop up, hope, hopeless, anxious, uncertain, hopeful, it's look, look in there, um, and sometimes curious or brave but um, really mostly people don't feel great about the job market. And also seeing those stats down there on the right hand side, don't feel a real sense of self-efficacy about the market, that they're prepared for it, that they know what to do. So what I'm trying to do in this, um, in this presentation and in all my research work actually, is give you a bit of data-driven hope about the future, that there is work out there, interesting work, and where, work where you'll be valued inside and outside academia. Um, this is the problem we're trying to address in a graph, really. Um, you can see here in Australia, and the trend lines look similar in other countries like New Zealand, the UK, Canada, the USA. We can see that there is some growth in academic jobs. You can see in the orange line there, but there's a corresponding non-linear growth of PhD graduates, which means there are too many graduates for the number of positions available. Successive governments in these countries that have marketised their higher education sector have made things more efficient, which means that they don't employ as much staff and they do, um, do um, teach a lot of PhD graduates because that's the engine room that keeps the research effort of the universities running. Uh, but that gap between that green line and that orange line is the gap faced by many people. 
It's filled with precarious work, um, sometimes some broken dreams of people who really did want to work in academia but can't find a place. And in fact, in Australia, this has been going on for a very long time now, since 1996, and in other countries too. It's a, um, a problem of long standing, and this this is why you hear so much negativity about um, doing a PhD, starting a PhD, and whether it's worthwhile in terms of getting an academic job. The picture can be pretty grim. In Australia, and similarly to the UK, um, similarly to in New Zealand, I don't have really good figures for Canada and America if you're tuning in from there, but about 50% of people leave the PhD on completion and 50% of people stay in academia. The people who leave go largely to industry and government, some go to high schools and not for profit, and others who stay, 20% um, of the people in Australia go either back to their home country or seek employment elsewhere. Um, and that net outflow is in every country. Um, if you look back through history and you look even back into ancient times, um, pictures of scholars have always been pictured on horseback. We've always been an internationally mobile kind of workforce going where the knowledge work is happening. Um, but this is extreme in this uh, 21st century. And now we've got a condition that we call hypermobility where people change jobs and cities in order to pursue an academic career. And that's relatively normal. Um, although a lot of people, of course, get left behind in that scramble. 30% um, of people who stay in Australian academic um, positions, 75% of them are doing casual or contingent work. And the story is very similar in New Zealand and the UK and Canada and the United States. Here's some figures from the UK. If you're tuning in from the UK, it's my night, it's your morning. You can see there that <clears throat> the number of people who stay in uh, higher education at the top there in the grey, and then uh, the number of other outcomes, research outside education, other teaching, um, doctoral occupations and other occupations. Doctoral occupations are often in the health area. And you can see there the breakdown is largely similar to Australia. Um, and it varies a lot between different um, different areas. So if in humanities, it's only 9% who are staying in, in research, 37% who are staying in teaching, and almost the reverse is true in biological science. A lot of people are staying to do research, but not much teaching. So it's a very, very different picture, depending on what discipline you're in and what area. Now, there are a lot of jobs for researchers outside of academia, and we can see that in this graph from Australia. Um, the people in the census who identify with research as a job, we can see that um, on a, small, a, a large amount, of course, are in universities, but in that grey area and in that orange area, there are people doing work. And we're interested in this grey and orange bits. What are the jobs there? What do they look like? How much do they pay? Where are they? What's the potential space? for you to have work outside academia. And I don't mean looking at where people are now. Other people have done that kind of research, sometimes following people through LinkedIn or following up with them in person to find out where people go. I'm interested in where you could be using the job ads to guide us with that. <clears throat> so a job ad is like a wish list for a person who probably doesn't exist, but it tells us something about what employers want from a potential hire, um, what are their skills and capabilities. And by assessing these, we can assess whether a job is PhD shaped or suitable for a researcher. Um, and we can map the, the area and the potential job market. And that's what I'm doing right now. Every six months we sit back, we take all the data that we've gathered in from our data provider for a year and we do an analysis. We find from this analysis that most of the jobs out there that are asking for a researcher do not say PhD in the ad anywhere. In fact, about 80% of the jobs in Australia, and this seems relatively consistent, do not use PhD anywhere in the ad. So that means if you type in PhD into regular search engine like Seek, you're only going to see um, academic jobs. And this can sound kind of reinforce the idea that there's only academia out there, and if there's no academic jobs, then you're um, chances are pretty poor when actually there's a large but hidden job market out there. So we want to make this hidden job market visible. <clears throat> we do it with machine learning and natural language processing. So what we do is we've designed an algorithm. It took us a couple of years to design this algorithm. It was very complicated. Um, and then we rank every job as it comes in through our data provider on a scale of zero, not very nerdy job, to 10 which is super nerdy, a research skills intensity rating or what we call a nerdiness index. And we draw a cutoff line <clears throat> 
through that distribution curve and all the jobs that coloured yellow there, we consider highly research intensive. Then we look at these jobs, how many are there, where are they, how much do they pay, and then we index them into our search engine post act. Um, each um, area of the job market looks slightly different. You can think about it like a different fingerprint. Um, this is uh, manufacturing, transport and logistics. We've got zero, not many research skills required to super nerdy. This data set came from SEEK in 2015. It was every job that they had that year. And we can see this distribution here of truck drivers who don't need a PhD. And then uh, office personnel and technicians might consume research um, and be more in the knowledge workspace, but don't actually make new knowledge. And then we look at the jobs that occur in this section of the uh, distribution curve. And under that curve, we see jobs in manufacturing, transport and logistics that are 3D printing, robotics, AI, machine learning, largely in this industry. Every industry will be different. But this one, I like to use the example of Amazon. Um, they used to have people in their warehouses. Now they have robots. They still need people to design the robots, to look, at the ro look after the robots, maintain the robots. And they're often highly knowledge intensive jobs. You see the same, I saw a drone footage um, flying through a Tesla gigafactory in Berlin. There were no humans pretty much standing next to the cars as they're being made. It's all been done by robots. The humans that you do see are standing around looking at screens and monitoring what's happening. And this is the future of manufacturing, um, at least high-end manufacturing in countries like Australia and the UK and Canada. Uh, it's a relatively small number of jobs that we index, so to give you some idea of it, in 2017, all the jobs that we rated above seven on our scale, which we thought were research intensive, there are about 64,000 of these jobs out of a total data set of 1.4 million. So these jobs are the kind of needle in the haystack, which makes searching for them difficult, hence putting our algorithm underneath a job searching platform to help you find them more easily. When we looked at the jobs in 2017, and this picture has changed a bit, but I'll use it as a demonstration and tell you how it's changed later. But we can see that the top 20 jobs of this pie graph, there's a large number of jobs in government. If we add up here public administration, central government administration, there's actually a lot. So government is a really happy hunting ground for those of you who are looking outside academia for interesting research related work of all sorts. So qualitative research, quantitative research, and there's a range of jobs in there, followed by banking and finance, which obviously is much more quantitative, but even astrophysicists can find jobs in banking and finance. Hospitals obviously always have a deep and abiding relationship with academia, engineering and accounting and so on. You might be wondering what's wrong with my algorithm because scientific research services is quite small. Um, but I'd like to point out that the biggest employer of Australians is retail. And um, retail gets a look in here at number 20 as a small slice. There are research intensive jobs in retail, but research services are just a small um, segment of our job market, slightly larger in the UK actually. Um, and we're starting to explore the, the UK space more deeply. Um, but if we switch the view and we say, instead of showing us the total um, number of jobs, show us proportionally which industries have more research jobs than others, we see that scientific research services stops being small and starts being big. And it's followed by a number of interesting, almost pandemic proof industries. So we've got here software publishing, that's your Microsoft, data processing, web hosting, that's your Google. I'm presenting from Google now. Non-store retailing, that's your Amazon. Internet publishing and broadcasting, that's your Netflix. So we have been doing a lot of sitting on the couch, ordering from the Amazon and watching of the Netflix. And so it's hardly surprising that the um, knowledge work market outside of academia, the research jobs have held up very well over the pandemic and are really strong even today. And um, we can see also that the pandemic caused some changes in how um, how many jobs there were available. For instance, it doubled the demand for researchers in supermarket and grocery stores. Why? Because it's a data intensive type of business doing online shopping and there needs to be more people who can work with data, understand data, analyze data and so on. Job ads are interesting also because they tell us the state and health of a job market and they're kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. Um, job um, ads get pulled down, it takes a while for people to lose jobs 
in a downturn, but job ads get pulled down immediately or not put up. And we could see that massive drop off the COVID cliff, we call it, between March and April 2020 in almost every country's job index. Um, and we can see in Australia, similarly to other countries, that was a sharp downward um, jump, but it's actually tra um, trended upwards since then. And up till recently, there's been a relationship between disease control measures and the economy in Australia. Um, but of course, all bets are off now. Apparently, we're not in a panic pandemic in the, anymore, according to some of our politicians. Of course, that's not true. Um, but we are. It's interesting to watch the the effect of the waves of COVID on our economy and our workforce. Here is the latest data from Australia. So we've got here the academic jobs and the non-academic jobs. In order to find and track this non-academic job market, we of course have to extract the academic jobs so we can give you an indicator of what's happening there. Interestingly, in Australia, of course, we saw this cliff and this climb back, um, and that was quite controversial because universities did cut down a lot of their workforces, but then they started offering jobs almost immediately at the start of last year. But we're seeing this wildly swinging pattern at the moment. And um, that's sort of maybe indicative of some of the, the uncertainties in um, financing um, in the universities and the recent election. We can see here the COVID cliff, but it's it's more than out um, paced by the COVID kind of um, peak up there. This crash here was Omicron and we can still see how um, the virus is really affecting the job market. There were lockdowns, snap lockdowns, and then um, a lot of um, problems there with Omicron when it started. And it happened around Christmas, which is a natural low point anywhere, anyway. But we can see that it's actually bounced back and we're still much stronger than we were before. So the picture there is good. Here's New Zealand, if you're from New Zealand. We can see that volatility there in the academic job market is quite jagged. Um, so similarly to Australia, I think universities are still in recovery mode um, with fees and with staffing. So we might see this volatility for a while. Likewise, in New Zealand, we saw a jump up, um, but a drop down again with Omicron and with opening up, but it seems to be trending up. So we're still sitting above the baseline. You can see the magnitude of numbers is much smaller than Australia. This is data from the UK and we are still waiting for our data pack to come from our data provider to bring us up to date to see what's happened since 2020. We have since validated this graph though, so it is recent, we think accurate. We had to do a little bit of retooling of our algorithm um, in order to properly extract the academic jobs because you use slightly different language to describe academic um, work. You can see here you've got almost a double dip. You were doing pretty well in 2017. Then, of course, you had Brexit, um, which knocked you back. And then, of course, you had COVID. And so COVID, like in Australia and um, New Zealand, um, you seem, seem to have a reasonably quick recovery through to 2021. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if that recovery is held up subsequently. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, there haven't been any big shocks like Brexit or COVID again, but you can certainly see you've had a double whammy there. In fact, maybe Brexit was worse than COVID in some ways. So we'll get a more fine grained analysis out and I'll put it in this slide deck as soon as it's available. Now, uh, we also want to just do a better tracking of academic jobs. So you can see here, this is Australian academic jobs ranked by um, field of research code, which gives you a sense of uh, also what teaching jobs might be available. This is a baseline here in 2019 before the pandemic. And you can see there's a lot of variation in the amount of jobs available in academia anyway. And every um, country, and we haven't yet done this for the UK, but we will get there. It's a little bit more retooling. Our algorithm is really tooled for Australia and we'll have to build a new one to really assess the UK, but we're working on that. Um, you can see there's a big difference between biomedical and health sciences and poor old philosophy and religious studies as an example. So in a good year, um, philosophy and religious studies um, has 24 jobs. In a bad year, it has six. Um, and then it's bounced back to 28 jobs, so it stays very low. 
Um, we can contrast that with um, biomedical sciences, biological sciences here, where you can see there was a minor dip in 2020. And we think some of that was probably to do with closures of labs and so on, um, rather than any kind of real loss of momentum. And it was back up to pretty much the same there. So I mean, I suppose the overall take home message to this is if you want an academic job, we're not all facing the same market and the same market conditions. And I think you need to match your expectation to, to where you're at. If you're in biomedical and clinical science, you've got much better chance of picking up a postdoc than if you're in philosophy. And I think this kind of, um, and we're trying to work on sharpening this up and getting some more dashboards available because this kind of information I think is really good for making decisions. How long do you stick around? How long do you give academia to work out if that's been your dream? Or do you press the eject button pretty much straight away and decide not to play? Um, this data can help. Uh, so where to next? <clears throat> I think um, uncertainty is constantly with us now had this COVID shutdown, you can see that there's been a recovery. Now we've got inflation. Now we've got climate change. Now we've got political unrest. Who knows what's next? So um, I think we just can bet on uncertainty in which way um, we need to just concentrate on what can we do? What's our own personal agency given all these uncertain conditions? How can we start to make good decisions? Um, First of all, thinking about the skill sets that you have from being in a, doing a PhD, when we look at the skill sets, and these come through in our MZ Burning Glass feed, we don't actually code for these, but they provide us with these measures and they, they're quite useful. We can see that non-academic employers and academic employers more or less kind of want the same thing, slightly different combinations of. The only real difference there is between project management at five and lecturing and teaching at five in academic employers, but number six in the academic employers list is project management. So, you know, concentrating on being able to work with people, communicate well, plan and collaborate with other people and get things done is, is a universal across all job markets. But how it's carried out in every job market, of course, will be very different. A good communication in academia often means the ability to write research papers um, if you're in a workplace, say you're in a consulting company and you're being um, you've put in some workplace to to analyze their workflows or something, writing them an academic paper isn't good communication, right? So what good communication means is very different in different settings. And I think being attentive to that and to be able to actually um, communicate what skills you do have and build new sets of skills um, is really important. So that sort of agility in taking what you already know, twisting and changing it slightly to suit the new um, setting. And whether employers are really receptive to that, that or believe you, that is a whole other issue as well. We've done quite a lot of exploration with employers um, about why they don't put PhD in job ads and what they think of PhD graduates. And some of it isn't good news, if I'm frank. Um, but if you are a in a subscribing university, please come along to our other sessions. Um, we do one on introducing postdoc. We do one on networking way into a job where we dive a little bit deeper on these skill sets and talk about what the differences might mean in practice. Um, very quickly, um, it, postdocs available in Australia and New Zealand. Hopefully most of you attending already have it, but we do make this open to anyone. So if you are interested, you can let us know. There's a link at the end of this slide deck um, where you can fill in your interest and we can let your university know. Um, when you log into Postac, basically what you see is a search, um, a search box. You can type anything related to the job you want and you can look in the archive or in the current job set. That's just the jobs available this week. This is all the jobs that we have indexed. There's currently over 200,000 jobs in there. I would just give the general advice that it's better to look in the archive first just because there's more jobs in there. There's about 10 times as many jobs in there as there are in the current job set, and you're more likely to get a match. And then you can start to zero down on the type of job you want and set up some searches so that you can um, see the current jobs as they come in. So it's set up to be really a research tool to help you connect with the job market and just see what's available. Um, you can type in long um, search strings here. We've got fantasy fiction, telling stories, women's advocacy. This is a search string that I designed for 
uh, a, a PhD candidate who was doing their PhD in English literature about Game of Thrones novels. Um, and that found a trainer in feminist theory um, um, going and teaching um, feminist theory in corporate settings, which she found quite interesting. Um, so uh, so this, um, we've got a sort of machine learning enhanced search feature inside it. So we encourage you to type um, really specific search strings in them and see what you get. Um, uh, and it will do a better job than, than something like Seek will in this particular um, setting. Seek, of course, has some other advantages. I don't want to say we're necessarily better, but we're trying to do a different thing here. We're trying to actually really show people what the opportunity space is, what's possible that you might not have thought of before. When you look down and you click on a job, we pull out those skill sets there that are provided by Burning Glass. We show you the text. And we also provide this very handy button here called more jobs like this and using our machine learning database we can match text together that looks similar to this job so we can find all the similar jobs in the database regardless of what their job titles are because job titles seem to be weird and wonderful and many many different job titles for essentially the same job and that helps you zero down in on those searches um, and of course, if you're looking in the current job set, you can click the apply button and go straight to where the job was drawn from the website where it's been advertised right now. And from there, you can take steps and apply. So what we're trying to do with Postag, I think more than necessarily match people up and get them to find jobs week on week is to help you think about your imagined future self. What other things could you be? What other possibilities are out there? This also helps you then find people who are already doing that job, or you can assess what kind of skill sets you have already and what you might need to pick up. Um, and it really just helps you approach the job market, I hope, with renewed confidence. And also just not feel so down about it. Know that there's many options available to you. Uh, we are designing some more features into Postac. Uh, we're still working on this UN development goals. We'd like to be able to show you all the jobs to do with no hunger, all the jobs to do with affordable and clean energy and so on. Um, but this is a very, very difficult, as it turns out, algorithmic project. Uh, and we're still working on it. We've been working on it for two years so far, but this is how long these things take. And this is why we decided to go with a commercial product because it provides us with a, a stream of funding. We're a not-for-profit, wholly owned by ANU at the moment and will be for the foreseeable future. All right, uh, so if you don't have Postac, what can you do? There are some good books. This one's an excellent one. It's also very cheap. It's $2.99. Navigating the Path to Industry is written by a PhD graduate whose job it is to hire PhD graduates into um, non-academic work spaces. So basically, she's seen every mistake that people make. And this is a short, um, little more of a pamphlet than a book that tells you how not to make those mistakes. Um, indispensable, I think it's just an automatic buy. Um, this is a longer version of the same thing, really. Uh, this is by Chris Catarine, who did his PhD in ancient Roman poetry, and it documents his entire journey in leaving academia. And he was really embedded, you know, he really saw himself as a tenure track academic and this is um, his way of uh, you know a gift really in talking through all the steps and all the emotional journey a lot of people have read uh, the previous book I showed you but the people who've read this book are really have found it to be um, a, a really indispensable guide it is however a little bit expensive so there is a review on thesis whisperer there and there's a soundcloud interview with him so if you want the you know just him talking about the tactics and strategies you can access that, but I do highly recommend getting hold of the book um, because it will make you feel better and make you feel like you've got some agency. I do like Cal Newport's, this Cal Newport book. I'm not actually a huge fan of the Cal Newport genre, but this book is quite good. The promise is in the title there, and it really does unpack this sort of follow your passion career advice, whether it's going to work for you, what kind of job markets there are, and how to sort of shape yourself um, for the job markets that you are really there rather than the ones that you imagine and posi position yourself for success. It is a good book and there's a lot of wisdom in there. Next steps to do. I always like some concrete actions when I go to a lecture like this. I don't want to walk away thinking, well, what do I do with all of that? Here's some ideas. I think just looking for people who are in that adjacent possible career. If you've got access to Postac, find those job titles, search on LinkedIn, 
um, ask your network of friends and relatives and find out where the adjacent possible careers are. And you can learn the most from talking to someone who's walked that path before you. Um, it's, you've made a good step in turning up, especially tonight in the evening after a whole day or early in the morning if you're in the UK, because you're prioritising your non-academic career development. You're not just going to writing workshops. Um, you're going to a full range of workshops. And also I would really um, stress that most people don't go near career centres. They assume that they're only good for undergraduates. That is their main business, but they do know a lot. And they can talk to you about the collateral, your LinkedIn profile, how to conduct yourself in job interviews and so on. Uh, there's a link there if you want to register your interest in Postac. And there's a Postac user manual um, just to show you um, how to use the product. But also at the end of that, there's uh, many, many more career tips and tricks and ideas. And a few more links there. I'm going to stop um, sharing the screen now. Uh, and so I can see your chat. And I think I'm going to stop the transcription. Uh, I'll turn off live captions. Um, and just invite you to ask questions in the chat when I can see it. <laughs> um, and um, please ask any question that's on your mind. You can either type it in the chat or put your hand up and ask it via voice. stop the recording because you're worried about being recorded. <laughs> 